Hello, hello, and welcome again to a Beatles program, a weekly talk show podcast that we call Things We Said Today. This is a program in which we talk about anything and everything that has to do with the Fab Four. It could be about their past, the present, and sometimes even the future. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. And you might be familiar with another program that I host, a syndicated Beatles show called Every Little Thing. I'm being joined by my two other co-hosts. First of all, we have our uh, resident musicologist, who for many years, and still is, writing for Beatle Fan Magazine, used to write for the New York Times in their classical department, and is a freelance writer right now. He's the author of Got That Something, How the Beatles Changed Everything, and From the Cavern to the Rooftop. And that's our very own Alan Cozen. Hi, Alan. Hey, Ken. How are you doing? And hello, everyone. And also, we have uh, Steve Marinucci, who writes for Billboard, Access.com, Variety, a whole bunch of publications. And he's also the author of Meet a Monkey, Davy Jones. Say hello, Steve. Hey, uh, hi. <laughs> hello, Ken. Hello, everyone. <laughs> oh, well. It's anyway. hello, hello, actually. Hello, hello. Show. Okay, well, hello, hello, hello. There's an old song by that, Hello, Hello. But that's... Yeah. That's besides... That's, that's up with, with Camel. camel. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> I love that song, actually. But anyway. Also okay. the Partridge family, if you want to get into that. But anyway, uh, our main topic on the show today is going to be soundtrack music written by Paul McCartney, specifically f- for films, songs that he was commissioned to write. And we're going to talk about that in a few moments. But first, we'll start with uh, the latest in Beatle news. And I know, Steve, you got some information about the Beatles being nominated for some Emmy Awards. Yes. And if I can find where where I put my sheet. Um, The Beatles were nominated for five Emmy Awards for eight days a week, which is really kind of really kind of cool. Um, They were nominated for... Uh, outstanding documentary or nonfiction special, outstanding picture editing for a nonfiction program, outstanding writing for a nonfiction program, outstanding picture editing for a nonfiction program, and outstanding sound editing for a nonfiction program. Wait a minute, what did I do there? And outstanding sound mixing for a nonfiction program, single or multi camera. So they were nominated for they were they were they they got five nominations there. So yay. Yeah. I kind of, I kind of have Amazing. some objections to that. I mean, Why? they are they are being nominated for best picture and sound editing for a film in which they replaced actual performances with performances that are not the performances being seen on screen. So I don't know that that should be should be rewarded really. Hmm. That the Manchester footage and you're hearing Hollywood Bowl footage, you know. When the Manchester footage is perfectly fine, or soundtrack, you know. So mm-hmm. uh, that's just my objection to that. Otherwise, I'm happy for the Beatles to win awards. It's just that, um, you know, if, if the title of the category is nonfiction, I think they should take that seriously. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Just saying. <laughs> no, I, I mean, that was, that was one of the points that we argued, you mm-hmm. know, very heavily when – we were talking about the the film. Mm-hmm. That was one of the big. In fact, I remember you especially were really all over that, and I think Al, Al was too. But yeah, I mean that was you know that was one of the points that people got you know got upset over is that you know that the the sound wasn't authentic in all the you know throughout the movie. But mm. in any event, okay. And uh, the award show we should say will be televised September seventeenth on so, CBS by the okay. great. Uh, Stephen Colbert. Somebody asked me, by the way, how they were getting nominated for an Emmy, and uh, my guess is because it was on Hulu. That's yeah, right. So that's what I'm figuring. Mm-hmm. Hey, so, I want go. more awards. More, more awards won for the Beatles. Right, right. The more, the merrier. Yep. Yep. Okay. Other news. Other news is that there's uh, they've already started ratcheting up. The promotion for Yellow Submarine for the 50th anniversary next year. They announced a new graphic novel by Bill Morrison, drawn by Bill Morrison. The information I got didn't say a whole lot about him, but I looked him up and um, 
He has done extensive work for The Simpsons. He has done extensive work for Disney. That's Mad where he started. Mad and he and he and he's now the executive editor of Mad because it's moving from the East Coast to Burbank. Hmm. So he's got he's got quite a bit of experience. Uh, I'm not a comic book fan. My son is, uh, and I know he would probably know who he is. And I'm sure comic book fans know because of his Simpsons connection, they know him. So it'll be that's going to be that's going to be kind of cool. Given that you know that kind of brings up the old you know the the former 3D, I mean the um, well the 3D version that they were going to do in the theater, mm-hmm. and I wonder I wonder how you know you know at that point especially since it's 50th anniversary now how if the objection to that would still be as stringent as it was because they didn't time that very well I mean they you know they. It was there was no anniversary. They just announced it, and people didn't go for it. And I'm wondering now that if they brought that idea back, whether they would whether they would do it again. I don't know. Well, remember we've talked about at least we've thought that the Beatles never cared about anniversaries at all. They hardly ever addressed it because it uh, it pretty much emphasizes the fact that something is old and. Well, uh, I, and I, I, and now with with what happened with Sergeant Pepper acknowledging that now we're thinking they're going to be doing more like with the white album and and whatever we're we're already thinking ahead so maybe if Apple is behind this then they're saying that it's okay the anniversary so aspect the the Beatles have come to embrace social media you've seen that you see mm-hmm. the you know i mean they they tweet out stuff every day Paul does, Ringo does, John and George, you know, John, the, the Lennon and Harrison estates, not so much, but Ringo and, and Paul have really taken to it, and so have the Beatles. And, you know, I, I think that social media, especially younger, well, younger people, because younger people are really so much a part of it, I think they would probably take it a little better now than they did or when this thing originally happened. I'm not saying, you know, they probably would have to find somebody new to do it, but it probably would go over better depending on who they picked. So. Hmm. Um, hey, I have something they should do. What? <laughs> what? Um, I had a glimpse of something like four hours of outtakes of Magical Mystery Tour. Now, this yeah. may this may seem like torture to you, but I'm telling you, there is a whole lot of interesting stuff that they did not put in that film. And I think, you know, Paul is always talking about how, you know, this film's time will come and people will eventually catch up with it. I think he ought to get this footage and go back into an editing suite and reconsider the edit. And make a new Magical Mystery Tour, because there is some really interesting stuff, some really funny stuff. And uh, I think that people would look at the film different. I mean, it would still be weird, no question about it. But, you know, just for instance, there is a big dinner scene where everybody, uh, you know, a lot of the actors in the cast were you know, actual actors and were kind of eccentric people, you know, who the Beatles just liked, like Ivor Cutler and, you know, Mm -hmm. um, Mm. various British musical types. And they, uh, and at this dinner, a lot of them get up and do their thing. You know, one guy gets up and sings a Gershwin song and, you know, Aunt Jessie gets up and plays the drums and she's really good. Isn't, (laughs) now wait a minute, isn't that in the... Wasn't that in the outtakes in the in the in the DVD? Maybe there was a clip of it. Um, I think I seem to I seem to remember that the the Aunt Jessie thing. Yeah, that she was a good she was a good drummer. There is did uh, they did they include the uh, I think they might have included a little of it, but not the whole thing of Ivor Cutler singing his song in the middle of the field with an organ. There was the, yeah, I think I think they did have little clips of all of that. stuff. Yeah, they had some. They had hmm. glimpses, but right. you know they they're. There is a lot of interesting, like, scenes that they set up where people would do interesting, weird things and just didn't get in the film. And I kind of don't understand it. 
Also, by the way, the footage I saw has the sort of uncensored version of um, Jan Carson, the stripper. So, uh, <laughs> ha! Yeah. Just for that alone, it'll sell. <laughs> yeah. So, really? So there you go. Well, I mean, you know, fiftieth anniversary know of that's four. coming up, and and but, and nobody's talking about doing anything about it. So. Well, they just did. They just Magical did Mystery something. Tour gets such a bad reputation, and it was that, out just uh, a few years ago. Right, and they had a chance. They had a chance to do something, and and again, they didn't time it to an anniversary, but they had a chance to do something really good with it. If you know, with all this extra footage, and they didn't. They really didn't do that much with it and maybe they will go into it and and i mean i as i said you know as we argued when the dvd came out i didn't think the new dvd did that much for it but if they did a you know a reworking of it well maybe maybe that would work i you know the outtakes do have way too much of magic alex but hey you know that's me uh. <laughs> Well, given yeah. given the people who are in this film, it, it lent itself to a lot of improv. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, but I don't know if the public's ready for four hours of it now. No, no, I don't think I don't think four hours. But the thing is that in the four hours, there's a lot of really interesting stuff that that they could reconsider including in a sort of a director's cut or something. You know. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That would be that would be that would be a nice idea, Apple. If you're listening. And we hope you are. <laughs> and I have a piece of news here about Danny Harrison because you've been hearing that he's about to do a couple of solo shows and he's been working on a new album. Well, the new album has been announced. It's called In Parallel. And there's three slashes after the in. I don't know what that's about, but it's coming out uh, October the 6th. And uh, there is a video that's about a minute long that I posted on my Facebook page. You might want to check that out, which has got one of the songs in there. Not sure if it's the title track or not. So, but it is coming out October the sixth. Okay, Steve. My final thing is just a small um, mention that I went through the set list of the the uh, McCartney shows on the thirteenth and the fifteenth, and again there was no big, there was no there were no big changes. He did bring back Junior's Farm on the fifteenth. Ken, uh, you're not cheering. Um, <laughs> I'm happy about it. I noticed when he returned to um, Miami, the first mm-hmm. two shows, if you look at the set list, the changes between the first two shows were mainly the second and fourth song. Mm-hmm. Because in the first show, the second song was Save Us. The fourth song was Letting Go. Right. And I'm glad he's still doing Letting Go. I love Letting Go Live. And then the second show, the second song was... Junior's um, Farm. Junior's Farm, and the fourth song was Jet. Jet, right. So that's how he's alternating between the second and fourth songs, if he does alternate at all. Right. So, And he also he also brought back, well, he had Birthday in that first show, and I saw her standing there in the second, sh- in the show after that. Mm-hmm. So, but he's, he's not making any huge changes. I mean, we've all known that for, you know, for a while. So Yeah, well, it could stay this way, or he might make some changes when he has some gaps in time there, mm-hmm. uh, certainly before the Northeast dates in September. So right. we'll see, especially if the new album, his new album is anywhere, if it's, if it's coming out, which we haven't heard anything about, but if it does come out, you know he's going to do something from that. So. Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Uh, I, have, I know some people that will be... Uh, the Los Angeles show. Unfortunately, I will not be, but it, that should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Okay, our main topic on our show this time out is soundtrack music written by Paul for films, specifically for Paul's solo career. So we're not talking about the Beatles films in this case. And just to be specific, we want this to be songs that he was commissioned to write or that he wrote and gave for a film as opposed to songs from his catalog that were offered for a film. Because there are lots of examples of those. If you go back to, um, well, recently, Cloudy with the Chance of Meatballs 2 <laughs> had the song New in there. Mm-hmm. And obviously it wasn't written for the movie. Uh, Jerry Maguire has a couple of songs from the first McCartney album. Two of the instrumentals from that album are on the Jerry Maguire soundtrack. 
So we're not talking about those songs at all. We're talking about songs that he wrote specifically for the films he was asked to write and he gave for a specific film. So we're going to start with a movie that came out in 1967 called The Family Way, which Paul did the, the music on his own. And would you like to comment on that first, Alan? Uh, yeah, sure. Actually, um, you know, that was that period before Sergeant Pepper when everybody was off doing their own thing and uh, Paul had been commissioned to do this. He got together with George Martin to talk about what to do and basically came up with roughly 15 seconds of music, um, <laughs> which he and George Martin then fleshed out into the, um, you know, love in the open air theme. Um, and then George Martin fleshed out further to be basically the whole soundtrack album. Um, Paul's involvement with it was pretty minimal. But, you know, it's kind of interesting that if you're going to come up with only 15 seconds of music, that it's a theme is it's really a memorable theme. It's it's very pretty. It's very attractive. It's got all the McCartney hallmarks. Um, obviously, it's instrumental. And uh, at the recording sessions, which George Martin conducted, interestingly enough, the principal violinist in the orchestra was a young guy at the time named Neville Mariner. Neville Mariner went on to form a group called the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields, made hundreds and hundreds of records, you know, of classical music um, as the leader of that. And then as the conductor, because he first led it from the violin. And then he ended up sort of doing freelance conducting towards the end of his life. Well, maybe a decade or two before the end of his life. Um, and uh, but, you know, it's funny because there were session shots and you can see him in there. And mm. so for this book that I'm doing with Adrian Sinclair and Chip, Mattinger, we sort of wrote to Neville Mariner when he was still alive. He, he just died a year or two ago and asked if he had any uh, memories of it. And, it, you know, I mean, his memories of the sessions were, you know, generally very positive. He didn't have a lot specific to say, you know, but um, but he definitely remembered having been there, work with Paul, Julian, you know, because Paul was at the session and, and George Martin as well. So... That's about all I have to say about that. Hmm. Interesting that that was really the early part of his career. Yeah. Yeah. He hmm. was a young guy at the time, 60, 1967, 66. So, um, yeah. Hmm. Steve, anything to say about The Family Way? Well, I mean, it was such an early uh, solo thing. I mean, it was, it was, you know, just them as a, you know, getting uh, one of the first – Beatles solo projects, um, and it it's you know there isn't a whole lot to say about it because it's it's so like Alan says there's only you know a few seconds of the theme, but the fact that it was you know it was so much a part of that it was used for that film and and it and it I mean I, it, I'm having trouble mouthing anything because there really isn't a whole lot to say. I mean there isn't a whole lot of music there. I mean the big thing is that it was such a significant point in the, in the in the Beatles because it was one of the first times that the Beatles had struck out and done solo. So I I guess that's probably the thing that needs to be really mentioned um you know um and also the fact that the film itself was interesting because it starred Haley Mills and it and Haley Mills up to this point had been you know considered a a child actor as you know a, as a little girl and in here she you know she became an adult and that was kind of a, a big development for her too so yeah do you guys remember because you're a few years older than me um if a big deal was made <laughs> was a big deal made about this film and the fact that paul wrote the music not, not really not, not that paul wrote the music that Haley mills you know was married i think that was the bigger deal Really? Yeah, not not that much was made. I mean, there were a lot. Of, there were a bunch of um, small articles in the British press, particularly in in the U.S. I mean, we sort of knew about it, but it, it, it not much was made of it. Don't remember ever hearing it on the radio. Um, 
By the way, in those articles in the British press, there was talk early on of John collaborating with Paul. And in fact, John mentioned it in an interview that he did while he was um, doing How I Won the War. You know, there's this talk of, you know, Paul and I doing a soundtrack for, you know. And then in the end, I don't know whether John just wasn't interested or Paul just wanted to get it done with, but Paul ended up doing it on his own. Uh, John, hmm. John doesn't seem didn't seem to care much either way, you know. Yeah. He, so you don't recall that them ever using Paul as a way of selling the film? I don't think so. No, really. no. The, I mean, the, the the film didn't really have much significance, or didn't get a whole lot of a play here. It got, I think, it got a lot more play in England. Yeah. Than it did here, but it really didn't get a whole lot of play here. I don't remember hearing the theme song on. The AM stations, yeah, um, so mm. yeah, it really, it really kind of just you know, not I wouldn't say disappeared, but it really was under under the surface pretty much. Yeah, so, I kind of feel the same way that you guys feel about it. It's a real pretty melody. It's just amazing how many variations you can make on the same melody mm -hmm. and stretch it out for a full album. Mm -hmm. I do I, recall, and I have a single of George Martin. He made a single, right? That he released with that melody on it too. Yeah, yeah. He, George Martin recorded it twice actually. Um, once on the soundtrack album, and then he made a single. You know, at the same time, basically um, under a different name, like the New Tudor Minstrels or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. One was the George Martin Orchestra, one was the New Tudor Minstrels, and released the single separately, not on the sound. Uh, you know, it's a, a different recording of it than the one on the soundtrack album. Mm. And, and then, of course, in 1995, as you know, there was that version that came out by a, a guy named Carl Aubert, I think a Canadian musician, mm -hmm. who did his mm -hmm. own variations on the theme from Family Way, and Paul seems to have endorsed it. Um, I think he might have written something in the in the liner note booklet or something. But um, so so it had a little bit of life after the film. I'm looking here at. Uh, the Beatles Bible, which has an article about the album, and it has the quote from New Musical Express, and it says the original, I guess the original title for the film was called All in Good Time, right? Which is kind of interesting. And then they and then they changed it to Wedlocked, and then uh, or it says the alternative alternative working title of Wedlocked has now been dropped. Producers having settled on All in Good Time, but then they obviously changed it again. So, hmm. there, okay. there we go. And we, we should also point out the name of the piece that Paul wrote was called Love in the Open Air. Love in the Open yeah. Air, right. right. The Family Way. Okay, so let's move on to a song that was a huge hit for Badfinger that Paul wrote, and that's Come and Get It for the Magic Christian. Mm -hmm. And um, really, I think it's a pretty significant song because not only was it a big hit, but it was so appropriate for the film because it really, it, you listen to the lyrics and it's all about money. And mm -hmm. that's what the film was all about, that people will do anything at any cost <laughs> to, for money, and it was very suitable. So uh, it, it worked on more than one level. It wasn't just a hit. It really fit right. the narrative of, of that movie. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love that film. That's a, that's a, a wonderful film. Apparently, Paul or a bad finger wanted to do the song differently, and Paul said, no, do it like the demo, the demo that we've all heard. And uh, because he knew it would be a hit, and he was correct. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a few years back, he did the song live on tour. So, uh, <laughs> I think that was in Europe only. I don't think he did it here. Mm -hmm. That'd be a fun song to drag out and and play. You know, I mean, that it, if we we've been talking about songs from the set list, that'd be a great song to play. Uh -huh. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows it. Well, <laughs> those that grew up with the song know it. But, uh, yeah, that would be a fun song to do live mm -hmm. and bring back. Mm -hmm. All right. Any comments about Come and Get It, Alan? Um, not really. I hadn't really thought of it as having been written for the film. But um, I guess maybe – do you know that it was? I, I for, forgot about it totally, actually. Well, you always hear it was written for Badfinger, but it, it was going to be used in the film. So mm. it just seems like – you know, if you know the storyline, yeah, it's it really fits. Film. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Hmm. All right, so then there's this other song you might have heard of. 
It's called Live and Let Die. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you've seen Paul in concert, there's a slight chance he might pull this one out of a hat. And might. He, and if you were sleeping during it, you definitely would wake up. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. He's always but, at, uh, you know, there's always in all the documentaries about his touring, there's always the, you know, the guys coming in, the, 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 the safety inspectors coming in to see that the pyro is okay for that song, you know. Mm-hmm. It's very explosive. And, <laughs> and it's funny that, you know, in, if you see him indoors versus outdoors, how the pyro is different in the in out you know the outdoors they they do a lot more. I remember at Candlestick and can you remember this? I mean, do you remember how explosive that was at Candlestick? It was pretty and loud. It was yeah. it was very yeah it was very loud and it was very explosive. I mean, the the fireworks went way up into the sky. Whereas when I saw him in Fresno uh, last year, you know, obviously it's indoors. They had to. You know, it had to be toned down a little bit. So, but uh, do you guys know that that was almost his second Bond song? No, oh. tell us, Alan. <laughs> well, <laughs> someone had talked to him. I, I think it, it might have been Ron Cass, who was who after Apple got involved with the Bond guys, um, and also to Tony Bramwell. Uh, he was talked to about doing a song for Diamonds Are Forever. And according to Bramwell, he did the song and turned it in. And it's just that he was late, so they didn't use it. Now, I don't know how credible that story is. Um, We've never seen any evidence of such a song. I mean, even though there are gazillions and gazillions of Paul McCartney outtakes on the bootleg market, um, it doesn't mean we've heard them all. (laughs) Um, That's true. And we've never heard anything like that. But Bramwell said so, and I think think it's, it's come up a couple of times that the first time he was asked to do if he was interested in a bond thing was diamonds or forever and it just didn't happen for whatever reason Hmm. and then there's the story of that george martin has told Mm -hmm. that after they recorded the version of live and let die the producers for the film heard it and said that's great who are we going to get to do it and that story is absolutely totally false but George Martin said it. Yeah, George Martin said that he didn't know Ringo was coming, and that's why he got Andy White. <laughs> How um, do you know it's false? Um, well, you know, in the course of researching this book, um, we, and I should say really particularly Adrian, has um, gotten his hands on a lot of documentation and correspondence, and there was never any doubt by anyone involved that – that was the recording. It could be. I mean, I can't. I can't say too much about it because you know the book and everything. But it could just be that George Martin misunderstood something that was said in a conversation over lunch with Harry Saltzman, who was one of the co-producers. Um, mm. But there were even press releases that came out, you know, even before McCartney recorded the song, um, mm-hmm. saying that you know he was going to do it, and they wanted the Fifth Dimension to also do a version of it for a different section of the film. You know, he, Paul was going to do it during the the, the title credits but the fifth Mm. dimension was going to do it then the fifth dimension dropped out for various reasons that um, probably had to do with management and they were going to get sissy houston and then she dropped out because again a management thing she was switching companies and they finally got for the alternate version that's in the in a a scene in the film um a singer called bj arno do either of you remember her version it's on the soundtrack album uh, it slips my mind. Yeah. Um, you know, she was like a, a, a soul jazz singer, you know, and um, it's, it's, her version's quite nice. But anyway, there was never any doubt. I mean, and, and um, basically the producers, I mean, from their point of view, say that when they first heard it, they, they thought it was great. Um, mm. Exactly why George Martin got that in mind or whether he was simply myth building, which, you know, is very possible, you know, because it's a great story. It really is a great story. It is. But it just... If I, if I remember what he said, he thought the producers preferred someone or, or they were thinking of someone along the lines of a Shirley Bassey or someone that's already had success with a Bond, a Bond film. Right. But 
he was commissioned not just to write the song for them. I mean, it was a contract for this. And the terms of the contract are that he records the song with wings, and then there's all kinds of details in the contract about who gets paid what for writing, for performing, um, that George Martin would be brought in to do the orchestration for the single, and then subsequently, you know, John Barry had done all of the the Bond soundtrack music, but um, for various reasons he wasn't available. So this lunch that George Martin went to where this conversation supposedly took place was really a lunch to talk to George Martin about doing the rest of the soundtrack music. And, I, I, you know, he may have just... You know what? One theory, actually a theory of Adrian's, uh, and I hope I'm not saying too much, they may get really mad at me. <laughs> Adrian's theory is that maybe what they were talking about was, you know, perhaps by the time George Martin went to lunch with them, The Fifth Dimension had dropped out for the second version of the song, and they might have been asking who George Martin thought would be good for that. But there was never any doubt that the title credit one was the recording that he produced. Mm. So there's a myth we've exploded yeah. right here on Things We Said Today. And, okay. And you can read more about it when the book finally comes out. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Alan, for that. Hmm. Not only that, but the, the hit version was so perfect the way it was. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's such a great, a great example of, of Paul and, and uh, George Martin working after the Beatles, you know, how, how ideal he was for a song like this. It's also a great example of how quickly Paul can toss off a really great track if he wants to. He took a weekend and devoted one day to reading the novel, the Ian Fleming book. And then the next day, um, like like Saturday, he read the book. Sunday, he's sitting in his house in, Ca in Cavendish Street, and uh, Denny Sewell ca came over and saw him write it, like right in his presence, you know, in, mm. in no time at all. And, and he, he talks about that. I don't know if he talked about that when he was on the show, but... Um, yeah, he did. Did he? I okay. think he said it, it took him like half an hour to write the whole song. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and he said, I believe he contributed the, the change into the reggae beat, Danny. Right. Although Paul has always said that Linda helped to... Well, she suggested the reggae part, mm -hmm. the reggae arrangement there. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. <laughs> Success has many fathers and mothers. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, let's get to another song. A song called Did We Meet Somewhere Before, which uh, actually turned up in the Ramones film called Rock and Roll High School, which came out in 1979. And I've got some background information about that if you guys want to know. Sure. Sure. Actually, the song was supposed to be the theme song for Heaven Can Wait, uh -huh. the Warren Beatty movie. Mm -hmm. But it was rejected for the film. And instead, Paul used it, and, well, Paul decided to just give it for that other movie, for Rock and Roll High School. Actually, in 1978, uh, we're going to talk about the next song, Same Time Next Year. It's kind of ironic. He wrote two songs that ended up being rejected by the film company for the, for the movies that they were to represent. So... But um, Did We Meet Somewhere Before is a very pretty song, and when it was in the movie, they only had about a minute and a half most of the song to feature, and we never heard the full version, at least I didn't, until it was on the Cold Cuts bootleg. Right. So, um, Alan, you want to say anything about that song? Uh, not really. It's, you know, it's an attractive song. It has certain moves that, that he... There are certain moves in it that you, you just can't quite place where you've heard him do them before. I, I actually listened to a bunch of tracks where I thought it was, but it wasn't. But it's, you know, it's pretty classically him, and it hasn't actually been officially released yet, right? I mean, it's just on nope. the Cold Cuts boot. Yeah. That's right. Hmm. So you gotta wonder where it's gonna turn up. If that it's 1978, <laughs> you know, it could be like London Town or something. I don't know. So that reminds me of my other idea that Universal should do. <laughs> well, actually, Universal can't do it. Now Capital could do it. Wait, wait Capital sort of is part of Universal now, isn't it? It's so yes. confusing. Um, <laughs> uh, 
You know, we were talking before the show about, you know, these various, um, you know, compilations of greatest hits and, you know, Pure McCartney and whatever that he periodically puts out. And he has never yet collected his film songs. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it actually, because to prepare for this show, I think we probably all made playlists with all the songs on it. And there's Mm -hmm. some great stuff that people don't know because either they didn't get the soundtrack album or it didn't come out or, you know, or or in some cases was rejected and didn't end up on a B-side or as a bonus track as some of them did, like same time next year. Um, Mm. But, you know, this would be an opportunity for him to also bring out uh, Did We Meet Somewhere Before? And, uh, you know, and and there are a number of other things. And I think it would make actually, I mean, the playlist plays really well. I I did mine chronologically. And, um, you know, I I think that would be an unusual compilation, you know, not a greatest hits compilation, obviously, although Live and Let Die is a big hit. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, and there's some great stuff, so uh, maybe they should think about that. Yeah, that's Uh, that's an excellent idea. We'll pass it along to our friends at Universal. (laughs) Really, uh, and um, the thing is, so many of these songs were just scattered on soundtrack albums or just singles. So it's nice to to put it all in one compact package like that. Would be really a great idea, I think so. Mm -hmm. Uh, Any thoughts about Did We Meet Somewhere Before, Steve? No, no, I have. I don't have any thoughts about that. Do you like the song? Um, yeah, yeah, it's 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 okay. Um, but no, I don't have any. I don't have any real thoughts about it. So well, it's 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 just another of the many nice ballads that mm-hmm. Paul's done through the years. Great melody. I think it might run a little bit too long, the full version. But um, but I like the song a lot. You know, I'll, so many of these songs that Paul did for films are ballads. Mm-hmm. And uh, they fit nicely where they're placed in mm-hmm. many cases. And then we have to talk about Same Time Next Year, because even though it wasn't used in the film, I think, personally, it was a great song. I can't see how it could have been rejected. It was actually passed up in favor of uh, The Last Time I Felt Like This. This is the Alan Alda film, Same Time Next Year. And uh, The Last Time I Felt Like This was a Johnny Mathis recording that was used instead. I think that was with, with uh, Denise Williams. So, but same time next year was uh, the start of uh, when Lawrence Juber joined Wings. That was the first session that he worked on. And uh, really nice orchestration on that song, too. It's one of those songs that's the last song that I play every year on my show. Mm-hmm. So I can tell people, hmm. I'll see you same time next year. Hmm. But, um, yeah, it really does fit and tells the whole storyline of the movie. And uh, what do you guys think of that song? Steve? I like the song. I like I liked the movie a lot. But... Uh... Yeah, I, I like that song. I do. Yeah, but me too. It's 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 attractive. It it uh, I thought it would have been perfect for the film. Um I can't quite even remember the Johnny Mathis song, but that doesn't necessarily mean it wasn't good, but um you know, I think of I I think of this when I think of the film even though it wasn't in the film. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. That's true. Well, that song is pretty much ingrained in my memory. It's it's just, you know, there are certain songs that I know from being on Cold Cuts, and I grew to love them when the bootleg came out, and they stood out for me as songs where I said, why didn't Paul release this? Yeah. You know, it didn't, it wasn't officially released until it was a bonus track on Put It There for the CD single. But right. um, let's move on to another song, uh, another ballad called Twice in a Lifetime. What do you think about that one, Alan? I really actually like that one, except for the saxophone solo kind of thing. And not, not that there's anything wrong with the saxophone playing itself. It's just that all these 80s films seem to have the sax and usually the sort of cheesy sounding electric piano. At least it doesn't have that. Um, the sax sound for me really dates it to the early to mid eighties. And, um, but apart from that, as a song, I kind of like it. I, I actually, um, as soon as the film came out on video, I rented it just so that I could tape the song off the (laughs) film soundtrack. Um, Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's, it's a good track, you know, not probably the best thing he's done or anything, but, or even among his film songs, but it's, 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 you know, 
it, it does the job. It's very attractive. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. Steve? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing extra special about it. It's a, it's a good track. Uh, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's about a good description for it. So. Well, so many of these songs still have very strong melodies to them yeah. and really good arrangements. And, and, you know, you listen to McCartney music for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, the voice has always been really important to me. And Paul's vocals on so many of these songs are just really phenomenal, mm -hmm. especially Same Time Next Year and Twice in a Lifetime. Yeah. I've always loved those songs. And I remember going to the movie theater just to hear the song which only played uh, during the end credits, and it right. wasn't the full version anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I was very pleased when I did hear the full version, which ended up as um, a bonus track on Pipes of Peace. And uh, just to hear the full version of it was nice to hear. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, a nice little addition there in the McCartney catalog. Uh, then we move on to Give My Regards to Broad Street. Hey. And we could do a whole show just on what about you know, honorary the soundtrack console? and the movie. Oh, I don't know if I'm doing this in perfect chronological oh, order. Okay. Let's let's do honorary council first then. Okay, I know that you have a lot to say about that. Well, uh, I don't know about a lot, but we could do it we could do it sort of quickly. It's a song that hardly anybody knows. Um it's an instrumental. The released version, there actually is no released Paul McCartney version. There mm -hmm. could have been. The released version was by the guitarist John Williams, who was, you know, when I was growing up and studying classical guitar, he was like one of my heroes. And this is not the best playing of John Williams. It's a fairly simple track, and he plays the melody, and uh, you know, it definitely has his sound, if you know John Williams' sound. Mm -hmm. I talked to John Williams about this, and he told me, and in fact played for me the outtakes, there was originally the idea was that he and Paul were going to do it as a duet with, you know, pretty simple percussion stuff going on. And, um, and they recorded it. They recorded several takes of it, and they're really nice. I believe there is one of them, one of the takes got onto the bootleg, the complete songs the Beatles gave away. Um, mm -hmm. But then the film producers didn't, they didn't like that version for whatever reason, and when they when it was time to record the remake, Paul wasn't available. So John Williams did it on his own. This version has percussion and uh, flute, like a like a recorder, kind of a woody sounding flute, and then just John Williams. John Williams released it as a single. You know, classical guys mm -hmm. don't often release singles, but he did. Um, it's also you can find it on an album called Film Tracks, the best of British film music. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, pretty theme, you know, a little like uh, Love in the Open Air in a way. Fairly simple, fairly, you know, catchy, the way Paul McCartney tunes tend to be. There's one thing the guy can do, it's write a tune. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so, you know, I would say if if you haven't heard the John Williams recording, try and find film tracks and uh, and listen to that, or get the bootleg of um, the complete songs the Beatles gave away and hear the duet version with Paul. Hmm. It might be on YouTube. I haven't checked, but it could uh, be. I haven't looked it, either. It, 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 it probably it, pro me. it probably is. That I, in fact, I wouldn't be surprised if all of this stuff isn't there. Yeah, I've never Steve, seen. What the are film. your thoughts about this? Oh. What was that, Alan? I, I was just saying I've never seen the film of either of you. No, no, I, I, no, I have. Honest, I don't know anything about this song at all. Um, I haven't. I haven't heard it. So, oh, it's actually it's very pretty. Like like Alan said, it has a, a Spanish guitar feel to it, which hmm. uh, I like a lot. You mm -hmm. know, it's it's very it's, it is uh, a pretty melody, very much like Alan said, like the Family Way was. It's very nice. I like it, and I think there are flutes or recorders in there too, mm -hmm. and it's. Uh, very pretty song. Yep. Okay, so now we talk about Give My Regards to Broad Street, but um, let's just talk first of all about No More Lonely Nights, because that was such a huge hit for Paul. It was a top ten hit here in the States, and I've always felt that it's you know one of his best ballads. He's given us so many of them, but as far as hits are concerned, this one's you know one of the tops for me anyway, and the recording of it was just superb. Paul's vocals are amazing. Dave Gilmore doing the lead guitar work. I've always felt this is one of his best singles, certainly as ballads. Hmm. Um, Alan, what do you think? 
Yeah, I really like that song too. And in fact, I mean, I know we'll we'll, we'll get all the sort of angry mail now, but um, I actually kind of like give my regards to Broad Street. I, I think I'm the only one who does, with the possible exception of Ken. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm just guessing there. But uh, um, I li- I like most of Broad Street, but I don't yeah. I don't equate that with the same thing as all the other McCartney albums because it's it's mainly covers. Of his you know, own, so of I don't look at it as. A, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, but there were like four. There were four. I think four new songs uh, on there. But, three. Well, three. actually, yeah. Four, if you include the instrumental of "Good Night, Lonely Princess." <laughs> yeah, that would be four. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, um, but "No More Lonely Nights" I thought was really a great song. Um, and there were, as you know, several mixes of it and extended twelve inches and all right. that. Hard to keep track of. But mm-hmm. um, I thought it was very strong, and I thought the video for it was really pretty good, too. And um, I think it, 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 it is one of the best things about the film, which I didn't find that bad. But, uh, ah. you know, I, I, you know what, to me, the, the film is fundamentally the same story. You wouldn't know it unless you really sort of think about it. It's the same story as A Hard Day's Night. Mm-hmm. You know, and in Hard Day's Night, Ringo's gone missing, and they don't know if he's going to be back in time for the show. And in this case, the tape of the album has gone missing, and they don't know if right. they're going to get it back in time. Uh-huh. So it's 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 basically the same thing. But I, I thought that the uh, you know a lot of the what he did with those covers of his own stuff, um, the remakes, and in some cases reorchestrations, I thought were really inventive visually. Um, hmm. so yeah, it kind of worked for me, but what can I say? So now you can't there say I I'm ask- always down on McCartney, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, dare I ask Steve? Well, with, without, without, I'll, doing I'll, the, I'll, without doing the whole show on this, I'll make, I'll make keep up, it brief. I'll make up for what Alan said about not complaining about it. Cause, uh, the, the movie almost got me in, it almost got me punched out. Let's put it that way, because my friend and I, who I will not name, but he's probably listening to this, saw the show, and we could see right away that this was not going to be a great night for McCartney. And we were we were inexcusably talking to each other during the show, and the guy sitting in front of us, who is very big, turned around and said, if you don't shut up, I'm going to, and I'll just let you guys fill in the blank. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, um, uh, No More Lonely Nights was actually one of the few bright spots of that movie. It really was. I mean, it's a great song, um, and it's it's too bad the whole movie wasn't as good as that. Uh, I I still don't think the movie was all that great, but that's – whatever. Um, that's another show. That's another show. That's another show. So there. But what about the music? Oh, I like that. I mean, the the re-recordings of the Beatles stuff, the fact that he got Ringo to, to do it and that George Martin was involved. I mean, that was, you know, looking back on it, at the time when you saw the movie, you didn't think too much about that. But now, I mean, it was, it's great that they that they were able to do that. You know, I, I don't see a lot of people these days recognizing the re-recordings as any big deal. I don't think people really were, you know, think about that that much. But it is kind of interesting that, you know, that it was both, you know, Paul and Ringo involved and George Martin. So, but a few, a few other talented people besides that. Right. Too, yeah, you know? uh, right. That's true <laughs> Dave too. Edmonds, you know, Eric Stewart. Mm-hmm. No, that's true too. But the movie itself, that movie just bombed badly. And, and I, I'm not going to argue that it should have been, it should have gone over better than it did because it really shouldn't have. But, you know. Okay. Uh, well, at, at some point, we'll do a show on the movie itself. There we go. Uh, but, but the music, I think, was fine. I mean, I, I can't look at this the same way as I would a new McCartney album of all new material. But it was nice for him to cover the Beatles stuff. I'm not going to make a comparison as to which is better. But it's nice to have alternate versions of some of these songs. It's nice to hear. It's nice to hear for no one with him playing it on acoustic guitar mm-hmm. with right. strings. I like that arrangement. I thought the whole medley of um, yesterday, here, there, and everywhere, and Wanderlust worked really well. You know, and I, I also love the version of the Long and Winding Road in there. Kind of schmaltzy, but you know that's one of my favorite Beatles songs where you can probably do no wrong with it, as far as I'm concerned. 
And I love the new songs in there, too. But, um, yeah, I, I thought that, uh, you know, the music was fine and it worked very well for the movie. Whether you thought the movie itself worked is a whole other ball game. So we'll talk about that in another show. But right around that time, in fact, when Give My Regards Street premiered in theaters, we also got this little animated film called Rupert and the Frog Song. And we all, uh, at least I hope uh, most McCartney fans know that Paul intended to make a full-length feature film on Rupert. Uh, Rupert is a bear who is very popular, has been very popular, I think, since the beginning of the 1900s. He's kind of like the Winnie, Pooh, Winnie the Pooh of England. That's how I look at it. And Paul always loved the character. And he wrote a whole soundtrack for a full-length feature film, which has been bootlegged. And the <laughs> full-length feature film has never come out. But this animated short did with the song We All Stand Together, which became a monster hit in the UK. It actually went to number two. A lot of people aren't aware of how big a hit that was in the UK. But uh, how about your thoughts on We All Stand Together? We'll start with Steve. I love this song. Absolutely adore it. Just seeing the film, I mean, uh, you can't really not talk about this without talking about the film. The film was deli- was delightful, and so is the music. I mean, it, it it synced so well with the film. If there's one, you know, if you're gonna if if we're gonna ma- mention a top five list of songs, and we didn't really put one together, but if uh, of his soundtrack songs, that would be on it. I think it's a great song. It's a wonderful. You love song. it that much? Yeah, I really do. I really wow. do. Wow, I'm kind of surprised. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. I mean, so many people rank on that song. And really? I think it's, it's, it's uncalled for because people forget what the purpose was of the song, that it's to be used in, a, in an animated a children's film with <laughs> animals in it. You know, It's very Disney-esque yeah. to me. Hmm. Alan? I, I just wanted to mention that the um, Winnie the Pooh of England was actually Winnie the Pooh because A.A. A. Milne was English. <laughs> but okay. Okay. anyway, um, I really loathe the frog song. Really? I'm sorry. Why? Yeah, it is just too damn cute. I can't stand it. It's like it's like if someone is like just pouring sugar into your mouth. You know, you you come on already. You know, no, it's just I it, and it also this for the same reason I dislike Wonderful Christmas Time. <laughs> um really? It, it yeah, it it has you know these sort of hooks that you can't get out of your head once you you know once you hear it um and even if you don't like it it just keeps coming back and uh i just i i I, it's one of my least favorite mccartney songs now that said if i were universal and we're doing this soundtrack collection that i'm mentioning i i definitely would include it because it it is what it is i thought the film was cute i you know cute in a way that is bearable and you know it was fine but um, you know, I understand, you know, his fascination with Rupert and all that. I, I, I just, I, I just hate the song. Sorry. I think oh. you have to look at it in the context of the, of the film. I mean, we're, we're trying to separate the, the songs outside the context of the fil- various films. In this case, I think you do, you do because it's an integral part of that film. And I, you know, for, that's one of the reasons why I, I think it's so good. I, I really do. Um, do you do you like Disney music, Alan? Not generally. Okay, well, I, I think I Disney mean, when I is hear- the devil, apart from Andrew Lloyd Webber. Um, <laughs> but uh, oh, God, uh, what? <laughs> now we're really in trouble. <laughs> you really got us in trouble now. No, I, I, I don't. I don't. I, I mean, and especially current Disney stuff, like you know, from Beauty and the Beast on, and it, I, I, I oh. hate that stuff. I just hate that stuff. Really? Yeah. yeah. Toy Story. Toy Story. Uh, Lion I, King. I don't even remember the music for Toy Story, but yeah, that's I, not I just, that's not Andrew Lloyd Webber. No, it's not. No, I'm not saying it is. I'm saying that Disney and okay. Andrew Lloyd Webber to me are both okay. Okay. <laughs> oh <laughs> boy. Okay. All right. All right. Well, I have a different opinion than you do, Alan, because I just think that it works for this context, and well, you have to put it in that context. This is what makes our show so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, you're, you're condemning Paul for having a talent where he writes hooks that stay in your head. I mean, that is a gift 
and we should applaud him for that. And instead, <laughs> you feel like if it's a, if it's a song that you can't get the the song out of your head, like you know, you should be critical of him for that reason. Well, no, no, if that it's is a song, that if is it, a talent. Here's the thing: if it's a song I like, I don't mind it being in my head all day. But if it's a song I hate in the first place, I want to be able to escape it. You know, there's a Roll mm-hmm. Roll Doll story. We might have talked about this before when we talked about, you know, Paul's hooks, where this guy composes a song that is so catchy that it actually kills you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and it's mm-hmm. it's it's sort of like that a little, you know. Also, also there's you I know Monty know. Python ripped it off with the funniest joke in the world. Remember that Monty Python sketch? Yeah, uh huh. So it, it's a little like that. I mean, sometimes <laughs> things, sometimes things, what do what they are supposed to do too well. <laughs> well, I think if you have a, a song stuck in your head, mm-hmm. that must mean that to some degree you like it. No, you may not want to admit it. Yes, admit <laughs> it, Alan. <laughs> it's you... a small world after <laughs> all. Now, 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 I really messed you guys up. Probably I... messed everybody else up because they're going to be hearing that. Mm-hmm. You know, gonna- I, I used to know. I, um, I, I have friends who have pretty much the same opinion of the song. And if I want to be mean, all I have to do is go. Wah, 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 wah. <laughs> it's the very <laughs> first sound of the, of the song, and that is enough to make them not be able to get it out of their head all day. <laughs> oh my! The okay. problem is, of course, it's like w- a boomerang. <laughs> mm-hmm. hmm. Well, I wouldn't mind that. No, keep doing it. Anyway, uh, so okay, so we we go to a similar type song because it's another animated song from Paul, Tropic Island Hum. By the way, there was a, a wonderful DVD that came out called Paul McCartney: The Animation Collection, which has three animated shorts. We're going to be talking right now about Tropic Island Hum. Rupert and the Frog Song was the first one. And Tropic Island Hum is very much in the same vein. When I hear something like this, I'm thinking of the Jungle Book, you know, something like that, like the Bare Necessities. When I hear a song like Tropic Island Hum, it has that kind of ring to it. And it's, it's up-tempo, it's catchy as hell. That's another one. You hear the melody, you can't get it out of your head. And I like Linda's part in the song. She did a really good job. And um, again, just proving how suitable Paul is, how adaptable he is for this kind of music. Alan. Yeah, I like this one better. <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> Which isn't saying a hell of a lot. Yeah, it isn't saying a hell of a lot. I, I, I like it better, and uh, it, it, for, for whatever, whatever it is that I find so annoying about the frog song isn't in this. Um, so it's, yeah. But I don't have a lot much more to say about it. It's, it's attractive, you know. But I'll it's pass also it on so to, catchy. Yeah. You know, it's catchy. If that was a like in a full length feature film, and that's the title track, if it was a successful film, a lot of people would remember it. Yeah, and it, just like a Disney film, it really is. Steve, hey, it's okay. I'm I'm not. You know, it's not. I wouldn't put it as one of Paul's greatest hits. But it's I'm okay. I'm not saying it's one of Paul's greatest hits. I'm just no, I know you're not. Purpose. I'm just. Yeah. I'm, I'm I'm saying that it's it's okay for what it is. So. No. I, I think it's, it's it, you know it's not a significant song, so yeah, it's catchy as hell. It stays in my head. Mm. I think it works for for the purpose of of this film. Well, okay, y- your opinion. So, all right. Anyway. What about uh, the next film, which was called Tuesday? What do you think of that, Steve? I, d- I did not get a chance to see this, and um, so I'm really kind of unfamiliar with it. I have to admit, so. How much of it was used in that film? Because the track is like 12 and a half minutes. Well, the entire film has got music throughout the whole thing. And is it all from this? Because I haven't seen that film either. But Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's that. There's also, I believe, a version that was on Working Classical. Right. Of it. And, um, yeah, it's, it's very, it's, it's got a classical feel to it. It's um, very pretty, very background. It's not something where you're going to be, you know, humming the melody over and over again, like you would Tropic Island Hum or We All Stand Together. But it's really good instrumental stuff. Very much, it, it could fit like on one of Paul's classical works. It is. Okay. 
it's on working, you know, as you say, it's on working I, classical, and it's it's it is a classical piece. I mean, I, I go farther than to say it has a classical feel. It's a totally classical piece. It's a pretty conservative classical piece. It's a lot like I don't know if if people haven't heard stuff by Frederick Delius. Uh, it's 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 that kind of thing. The sort of what they call the English pastoral school of the early twentieth century. And, you know, it's really nicely done. It's really nicely orchestrated. Um, I kind of, I, I kind of have always liked the idea that he's that interested in this kind of music to want to devote himself to doing it. I mean, it doesn't sound like something that he just sort of doodled off on a, a synth and handed to an orchestrator, which maybe it was, but you know, it sounds it, it it sounds reasonably well thought out, and and you know, it goes over a you know twelve and a half minutes. That's you know reasonable amount of time, and um, you know, I, I I kind of I I like working classical and the the pieces on it, and that's one of them. So, and I know it mainly from that. So yeah, yeah, it's nice to have. That DVD of Paul McCartney's animated collection all together, mm-hmm. having all three shorts there. And uh, it's a nice film, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, with frogs. And I, I think Paul has an obsession with frogs. <laughs> I see. I don't know what it is. But, he, he, um, he still feels guilty for having burned one when he was a kid on a light bulb. <laughs> is that a fact? Yeah, he talked about it in uh, probably in many years ago. Um, He's talked about it a couple of times, how he and his brother used to do that. I mean, I don't think we should dwell on it, but but yeah. It's something that's okay. obviously he remembers and feels bad about now that he's like an animal rights guy. Mm. You mean many years from now? Many years from now, right. Yeah. Um, and actually, if you do watch that animated film for Tuesday, um, Dustin Hoffman does some voice work in there. Mm-hmm. And if you listen very carefully, it's about... I think three or four minutes into the, the film, there's a man in the kitchen. He's got the radio on, and you can hear the old standard tenderly, and you can hear Paul sing it very faintly. <laughs> here's, here's some trivia for you. Dustin uh, Hoffman. You know, we know that Dustin Hoffman and Paul are pals and that you know, he right. wrote Picasso's last words basically on a dare from Dustin Hoffman, but you can't write a song right now. But if you look – at a lot, I haven't looked at every single one, but an awful lot of Dustin Hoffman films have some sort of Beatles reference in it. In, uh, what was it, Hook, the Peter Pan one, when the little girl is in her room um, and Peter Pan comes in, you see she's got little Beatles statuettes all over the place. <laughs> in, oh. in Tootsie, when he is, he's sharing room with Jessica Lange and she has the big London Palladium Beatles poster on her wall. Um, hmm. and there are some other ones too. I, I can't remember them offhand, but I, I remember being struck by you know every time I went to a Dustin Hoffman film for a while, uh, there was there was some Beatles reference. You know, <laughs> hmm. not, huh. obviously not. It's not in The Graduate. It's not in uh, you know Marathon Man probably. But mm. no. uh, you know, maybe that's Dustin's influence. We don't know. I wouldn't be surprised. I really wouldn't be mm-hmm. surprised if it's a little in joke that he put has them somehow do in his films. Okay, um, let's do another song. Uh, this is this is um, the theme for the movie Maybe Baby, which mm-hmm. is Paul's cover of the Buddy Holly song. Mm-hmm. And um, to me, I mean, Jeff Lynne produced it. It's got Jeff Lynn production all over it. <laughs> mm-hmm. If you were told that Paul was going to cover Maybe Baby and Jeff Lynn produced it, it would sound like this. Yep. You'd probably have it in your head anyway. Mm-hmm. But it's still fun. It's still fun to hear. Alan, what yeah, do you think? It, it's a really rocking version of Maybe Baby. I, I really like it. Uh, it. It's a mere two minutes. It's actually less than two minutes. It's a minute fifty eight. Um, mm. wouldn't have mind if he worked out a little more on it, but it, you know, it has great sounds, uh, and we know Paul's connection to Buddy Holly and the Buddy Holly catalog and, and all of that. So it's just a fun track. Right. Yeah. Anytime he's done Buddy Holly, he's always put a lot into it. I mean, even, even something short like this. So yeah, I mean, there's no, there's no surprise that it's a, it's a good version. So, Okay. Ah, here's one that I skipped over. 
And that's Spies Like Us. Oh, yeah. can't believe I didn't say that one. All right. I can't believe you didn't say that one either. Yeah, well, I've got a list in front of me, and I just missed that one. That's all. Yeah. So, Al- Alan, what do you think? Um, yeah, that one is okay. I, it kind of has some nice effects on it, and it's uh, really not a bad song. The film went nowhere. Um, probably the song is the best thing about the film. Yeah, I don't have a lot to say about it. Actually, I kind of like it, you know. It's, uh, again, it does the job, you know. It has a kind of humorous quality to it. Um, well, maybe I'm influenced also by the video that they made for it, which was actually kind mm-hmm. of funny. Um, yeah. But, you know, it was, it, it, I think it, it fits the film was supposed to be. And it's not a bad track, and it kind of um, made us think that the stuff on press was going to be better than it was. Mm-hmm. Sorry. <clears throat> um, yeah. <laughs> Go back to our Press to Play show. I love Press to Play. I will always defend it. Anyway, Steve. I like I like Spies Like Us. It's a, it's a, a good standout single. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know. I think it's a. I think he did a good job with it, uh, and I agree with Alan. And I, I, to be honest, I haven't seen the movie, but judging from the reaction to the song versus the reaction to the movie, I would say the song is better than the movie. So hmm. there we go. Well, the song for me, I've always loved the sound of it. Mm-hmm. It really, especially the way it's produced. Uh, lyrically, it's lacking something, you yeah. know, in some of the verses. Ooh, ooh, what do you do? Uh, no yeah. one else can dance like you. But then there's some good lines in there, too. We get there by hook or by crook. We don't do a thing by the book. You know, I like lines like that. And um, it's it's extremely catchy. I love how it rocks out at the end. Mm-hmm. And I especially love that whole middle section. It really has a very electronic 80s sound to it, but I, f- I still think it sounds very contemporary. I, I kind of wish I would, he would I bring that I would, out. I wouldn't call it contemporary. I, I'd I say, think so. No. I think I think it's it it's definitely sounds dated, but I think it's I mean I still think it's a good song. So well, I, I kind of disagree. I think it sounds very fresh, and I think that it would work really well live. Oh, I th- I agree there. I think it would be great live. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be a lot of fun to do it live. That's another one that he could easily pull out and and have some fun with. Sure. Yeah, yeah. but the whole arrangement really is what makes it stand out for me, mm-hmm. especially that middle bit. You know, the heavy drums, Mm -hmm. the guitar solo, everything about it. I think it was very well done. So let's do another song and let's talk about Vanilla Sky for the Cameron Crowe film. Uh, Steve, let's start with you. It's I mean, it's a ballad. It wasn't I mean, it wasn't uh, I mean, there. here's a uh, it's kind of the reverse of Spies Like Us, although that film actually went nowhere. I mean, that. As I recall, it it didn't really do anything, but um, I mean, it was it was okay. Uh, I wouldn't call it. Uh, a, you know, if you're putting out a McCartney's greatest hits, I don't think that song's going to be on it. So, Alan, but it can be on the film song compilation. <laughs> True. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's uh, it 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 doesn't do a lot for me either. I don't I don't actively dislike it, but um, it's you know, it, again, it's an attractive. McCartney melody. It, it again has that sort of fluty thing that you get also in honorary console. And uh, but yeah, it's just a it's just a nice song. Uh, I, I don't remember anything about the film actually. I have the DVD, but I probably got the DVD because there's a I think there's a McCartney featurette on it. <laughs> oh, is there? Mm. Okay, I, I thought there might. I thought think there was. Mm. Okay. Huh. Well, I actually love Vanilla Sky a lot, and because I do like the acoustic side of Paul, and I like the lyrics, I like the imagery in the lyrics, the sound of it, Paul's vocals, it has a bit of a jazz feel to it, and again, with the flutes, or I, it's either flutes or recorders that he uses in there, it has a nice feel to it. It's a simple song, but you know, I think it works in this context. It was actually nominated for a Grammy. Right. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, this is the kind of song, I-, I love the acoustic side of Paul, whenever he does these two, three-minute acoustic songs that have a really nice melody to them, and his voice just works so well with it. And uh, I like it a lot. You know, I think it's a very underrated song. 
hadn't one of you guys said that Once Upon a Long Ago was also intended as a film song last week? Well, yeah, I I read that it was supposed to be Paul writing it for The Princess Bride. Uh-huh. Hmm. And I think Wikipedia lists it as such, as well as Beautiful Night from Flaming Pie, and Rob Reiner turned it down. Now, I don't know how accurate that is. Hmm. Right. But then Paul released it himself, and it was a uh, top ten hit in the U.K. So, uh, but Flaming, so they are Rob Reiner. <laughs> Flaming Pie was much later, though, right? Or, or was Beautiful Night that early a song? Oh, Beautiful Night was an early song. Yeah, it was done around 1986 or so. There's mm-hmm. the early version that came out that Paul released himself on one of the CD singles mm-hmm. from Flaming Pie, and it's been bootlegged. And the, there's an early version that has members of Billy Joel's band backing uh-huh. up Paul. Seem to be blanking yeah. out on that, but once upon <laughs> a long ago is uh, you know it, it's 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 one of those songs that you know the puppy dog tails thing. I mean that's come on, but there's some nice stuff in it, including violin solo from Nigel Kennedy, who was a, a classical violinist or classical slash sometimes rock violinist. He also played on on uh, Kate Bush running up the hill that hill, mm-hmm. um, and uh, he's 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 you know, a wacko. I mean that in a good way. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, I, I kind of, there are, there are things I like about that song, things I really dislike about that song, but I included it in my playlist for film songs. Hmm. So okay. I was, was asking because um, when have you said that? Yeah. Uh, Once Upon a Long Ago, I love, you know, there's a lot behind the arrangement, especially there's a middle part um, where there's a lot of harmony work. Mm-hmm. And it kind of sounds like a madrigal, you know. We talked about counter melody with McCartney. Yeah. Listen to Once Upon a Long Ago. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know that whole middle part there with uh, Paul and Linda working on their vocals. Yeah. There's a lot of work that I felt was put behind that song. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if I uh, if I'm that crazy about the lyrics. Yeah. But um, that could be stream of consciousness lyrics from Paul. Sure. You never know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lyrics need a touch up, but the music on that is really good. You're right. Yeah. Didn't uh, Once Upon a Long Ago get promoted more in, in Europe than in America? Yeah, I don't know. Was well, it even was released here? Right. It was never. Uh, that's, yeah, that's what I was thinking, that it nearly never really got not much of a release here. I mean, I, like, I do like the song. I thought it was, it was good. I never understood why America got... Can I use the word screwed? It's screwed weird. Screwed out song. It, it, you know, it never got released here, and yet in England and even Japan, I mean, he made a million TV appearances playing it. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. and, um, and, I, and I don't, you know, I, I, yeah, I never understood why that song did not get, did not get any promotion here. You know, I, I just don't, there was no, it's not like it's, you know, uh, Mall of Kintyre, for God's sake, you know, I mean, why, why do that? It, it's a good song, you know, mm-hmm. it probably would have done very well here had he, taken you know given given it a chance so i don't know i don't know the the full story behind that yeah anyway we got a few more songs left uh how about i want to come home which was in the robert de niro film everybody's fine Mm -hmm. uh we'll start with you steve that was an okay ballad i mean it, it fizzled out and died rather quickly and you know i it it wasn't a what i would call a blockbuster song, um, you know, it was what it was. That's there's really nothing dis- distinguishable about it, as far as I'm concerned. But why do you mean it fizzled out? <laughs> because it wasn't that good of a song. Oh, I don't believe that. Well, at I all. do. I, I I don't think it was that great. I mean, it 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 just wasn't. It really. I mean, it went nowhere. And it for well for a very you know there's a. A full show we could do with why the newer solo music of the Beatles doesn't go anywhere. I don't. I don't think you know, that has nothing to do with this. This that has a lot to do with it. No, it doesn't. It yes, really it doesn't. does. It's not that good of a song. Don't it try does. and make. Don't try and make this a better song than it is. Al, Al, I think it's a. I think it's a very good song. Fine. Every time I. Yeah, it's I do. Not, well, I don't think so. Okay. Well, that I doesn't really mean that you're right. No, but it doesn't mean that you are either. And you're 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 taking you're taking over the opinion and saying, yeah, but it's a great song. 
you may not be the, you may be the only no. one out there. That I feel I talking. feel like I should put on my referee shirt and stride into yeah. the. Radio. No, what I what I am arguing about here is that when you say it fizzled out, what do you mean that radio would have played this song if it was a good song? Yeah, it, they no, did. radio barely plays Paul McCartney's newer music, and that's just a fact. They would you know, have and it, it and if you think the only criteria behind whether or not a song does well is because it's good, I've did got a bridge get, I could sell you. Did it get any airplay at all? Did it get I didn't, it I didn't hear it. So okay. there's a lot and of McCartney it, stuff that doesn't that get airplay. It, that says it right there. No, it, it doesn't. Not, yes, it does. No, it, it doesn't. Not. It does <laughs> not. Two album got you can't more just say there. you can't just say if if radio doesn't play it, it's not a good song. Help. Uh, no. <laughs> I, I don't listen to the radio, so I can't tell you anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, radio <laughs> plays a little bit of Paul's new music, and that's about it. Don't, and it has nothing to do with the quality of it. If you like this song, fine. I don't particularly think it's one of McCartney's great songs. I didn't say okay. it's one of his great songs. He's written a lot of great songs. But I think you're it's trying a, to pump it more than it deserves. I don't. I think it deserves more attention. Fine. That's your opinion. I to like it a lot. Your opinion. <laughs> Okay, and that's what we're here for. And that's what we're here for, uh, Alan. I think turn. I think it's okay. Uh, actually, you know, it's one of those songs that since it's it's what two thousand nine, I never listened to it that much when it came out. I just sort of got it, put it in the playlist, mm-hmm. listened to it once or twice. Thought, well, you know, okay, well, you know, whatever. On to the next thing. I didn't find it that memorable, but when I was listening. In the context of the film song playlist this week, I kind of thought, you know, hey, that's not a bad song. Why don't I? Uh, why? Why haven't I heard that more? You know, so um, you know, I'm not saying it's one of his best songs or anything like that, but I, I think it, you know, it has a lot of those characteristics that we like about Paul songs. You know, it's okay. Uh, it's okay. It's it's. Um, I'm I'm coming down, I guess, somewhere between the two of you here. Um. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I mean, in the whole scope of things, I don't think it's any any weaker uh, than, say, Twice in a Lifetime, which I think is a very good song. I mean, where's the difference here? I don't understand the criteria of, of what you're saying about "I Want to Come Home" that makes it not a good song. Because it's it, it, it's. There's, it's just out there. It's an, it's an isolated, putting it out there as an isolated song. It doesn't, it doesn't. There's nothing too attractive about it. At least I don't see it. What do you mean an isolated song? It's a song for a movie, and that's it. It's not on a McCartney album. It doesn't belong there. It's a song you contributed for a movie, so right. it's isolated from the rest of his catalog. Right. The same way many of these other songs but it's were. Not, it's just not that that interesting a song, as far as I'm concerned. What what makes it not interesting? The whole, do you like the, the Do you like the melody of it? No, not particularly. It's pretty. It's 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 very low key. You know, it 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 doesn't. There's nothing really. Uh, hook. There's no real hook there, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I, after a few listens, I've been hooked. It okay, stays in my head. Fine. Okay. So all right, the next song. Which is debatable to put in here, but, you know, we've been talking about this. Hope for the future is really for a video game. It's not for a movie, but yet it's soundtrack music. So um, what do you think of Hope for the Future, Alan? Mm, Not so fond of it. (laughs) And why is that? Um, I don't know. I... I, uh... To tell you the truth, I mean, maybe maybe I was sort of overhyped on it when it was about to come out. I mean, the the, Mm -hmm. the, um, game production company guys were telling me that Paul thought this was the best thing he ever wrote, which I'm sure he didn't think and maybe never even said. Um, but, you know, it, it, it led me to expect a really great track, and it just turned out to be, to me, a little kind of boilerplate hopefulness kind of thing. It, it didn't really grab me in any way. And again, there are like 18 versions of it, so it's that that puts it up there with Oué Le Soleil in my book. <laughs> 18 <laughs> versions of a track I don't like that I have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, don't don't take it out on the song if there's a lot of versions of it. That's just true. the the main version you don't like. 
Yeah, it just seems a little weak to me. And how so? As the lyrics are very positive, it conveys yeah, the message. Yeah, it's positive, but it seems like phoned in positive to me. I, I don't know. I, hmm. It just never really grabbed me. Um, hmm. But again, it, it may also be the context of the whole hype thing too. You know, which is something that you know is just me personally because of dealing with these guys. It, it, may, it wouldn't be something that anybody out there would have had to have dealt with. So. Um, mm -hmm. you know, that's just, that's just the residue of that. Perhaps ask me in 10 okay. years. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it could always change. Yeah. Steve. I, I, and I'm going to, here we go again. I love this song a lot. I really, really do. I love the production, the way it, the, the way the, um, I love the production on the song, the way his voice, Came and the music came, uh, you know, uh, combined on this thing. I, I, this is, I really like this song. I do not particularly like the version that was on um, Pure McCartney, but I, I the uh, remixes were. I, I really like the remixes. I, so and it's funny. I bought Destiny after, you know, to to hear the song, and I never heard the song on the game, so. I don't know where the song. I I had trouble getting through the game, but I, <laughs> on top of that, because I'm not that great of a, a video game player. But uh, if anybody knows where the song is in the game, tell me. Um, but because uh, I always wondered. But uh, no, I love the song. I really did. I thought it was. I thought it was a great song. Mm. Well, I'm not a video game player at all. I only cared about the song. <laughs> okay. Full disclosure here, but I think it. This is a great song. And I think so because of everything put behind it. The the orchestration is wonderful. Giles Martin did a great job producing uh, the song. Um, I love the lyrics, the positive message in it, and really good words. Um, we will build bridges up to the sky, heavenly lights together, you and I. Really nice lyrics in, in the song. And a great buildup melodically. I love everything about it. The horns what's, in there. So What's funny, that has nothing to do with the game, at least the way I interpreted the game having played it it has nothing <laughs> it you know this whole thing about hope for the future you're kind of expecting mccartney or that to be a, a part of the game and it's not at least the way mm. i played the game my experience with the game it was not that it was not part of it but again i'm not what i would call a video game expert um i did buy the game and i did play it and for anybody that is interested, you can go down to GameSpot and probably get a copy pretty cheap nowadays. If you're, you know, if you have a PS3 or a PS4 or a Xbox, if you want to have it in your collection, uh, the used copies are very cheap. But um, the question is, where where on this on this dumb game is is the song? I don't know, but I like the, I do like the song. I have to say, so okay. All right, so now we get to a very recent song called In the Blink of an Eye, which was in the film Ethel and Ernest, A True Story. And uh, kind of in the same vein to me as I Want to Come Home, very nice, gentle ballad with a nice melody and all. And I personally like it. How about you, Alan? Um, yeah, it's, it is up sort of in the same, uh, league as I want to come home. It's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's an attractive song. It does suffer a bit from the current state of his voice, I think. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I have to say, you know, on the playlist also, since it's the, the last one on, on mine anyway, um, there's a, a huge leap <laughs> in the vocal sound from you know everything else to that one and um yeah just there's just that um but the song itself is 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 okay didn't really dislike it or love it basically mm. that's what i have to say okay <laughs> steve. and steve i think the song I, I i agree with alan pretty much i think the song would have been a lot better had his voice been a lot better uh, and I think that's the one thing that drags the song down. And it's too bad that that's the case. Um, and you basically have to, that's one of the big factors that that uh, renders the judgment of the song. But yeah, it's it, the voice, his vocalizing on that song doesn't, doesn't help it at all. Not at all. Mm. I know when I first heard the song, 
it was noticeable to me about his voice, but I've gotten so used to it. It doesn't really bother me all that much. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, I still think it's a, it's a pretty good song, very pleasant. And, uh, and I certainly would like to see a collection, like Alan has suggested. Yeah, no, I think, I, think, I think that's an excellent idea. Um, and uh, we, all, we have connections. We could probably tell them about it. We probably <laughs> should. We probably should. If so. anything, it would make the public aware of how much work he's really done for films. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy, even for people like us, to overlook a lot if you don't think about it. But, uh, yeah, and there may have been a song or two that we didn't include here. If there is, I hope one of our listeners writes us. But, uh, yeah, this was a lot of fun discussing uh, Paul's work for films. It was. Anything else you guys want to add? I just think listening to the whole playlist is was was just a, a very interesting experience because there is actually a lot of different kinds of music here. And, um, you know, some things I like, some things I don't like, some things I'm lukewarm about. But ne- nevertheless, I, I really think that it overall is a really good collection of stuff. So this has been a great discussion, talking about Paul's soundtrack music, his, his uh, music composed for films. Very, spirit, would... very spirited. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows? It may get even more spirited in upcoming shows. <laughs> oh, yes. See? <laughs> Maybe so. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Steve? I, I, I'm not going to say anything. Uh-huh. So, anyways. So, if you would like to get in touch with us, uh, let's start with Steve. Why don't you give everyone our contact information and your personal contact information? Um, our contact information is Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at uh, Things We Said Fab. Uh, we have a, a Facebook. Actually, there's two Facebook pages. The show's fa- Facebook page is Things We Said Today uh, Beatle Fans. Um, there's a Things We Said Today Facebook page that's actually connected to Fab Four Radio that runs the show every week. Thank you, Matt. Uh, we never say thank you to Matt. Um, mm-hmm. but Isn't it Matt. Uh, Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans? Right. The Facebook page. Did I say, what, what did I say? Left Out Beatles, Radio. Beatles fans? Oh, okay. Beatles radio fans. There we go. Um, and we're, you know, we're always posting information on the show on the Beatles radio fans page. And we're individually, uh, my individually, I have a, a, a personal Facebook page that really is, is for Beatles stuff and other stuff. But for Beatles stuff all uh, completely, it's Beatle news and information. Um, join there and, and there's all sorts of stuff being posted. My those stories that I do, and and other stories uh, that are happening, and Beatles stories that are happening. And who knows? Uh, every day is a surprise. So there you go. Oh wait a minute! I didn't, I didn't tell my email address is Beatlesexaminer at gmail dot com. Sorry. Go. Okay. okay. Alan, your turn. Yeah, you can get in touch with me um, either at uh, on Facebook at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix, but I also read the mail that comes to Things We Said Today Radio Show at gmail.com, so, and also the comments on the YouTube versions of our show. Yeah, we all read that stuff. We're yep. all curious to know what you guys think of our show. So keep those comments, those comments and letters coming, folks. And as for me, Ken Michaels, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. My website is KenMichaelsRadio.com. Don't forget, every week there's Beatles trivia on there in which you can win one of nine great prizes. And it ranges from CDs to DVDs to books every single week, starting Monday through Sunday. And every week there's a winner, and it could be you. That's at KenMichaelsRadio.com. All right. So for Steve Marinucci, Alan Cozen, and myself, Ken Michaels, we just want to say thank you all for listening, and we will see you next time.